Good afternoon. Um, I hope you can hear me. Somebody, can you hear me? Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, today's lecture will be in English because it's aimed at, at a wider audience. And um, uh, I'm trying to explain a relatively complicated issue that uh, I think will, will, will have quite a bit of an impact uh, worldwide in terms of, of, of various, uh, various, um, various sciences. I'm changing physics paradigms in our defense against viral pandemics. That's just the, uh, the, the uh, I'm going to talk at the end about black puzzlation, uh, but that's actually just an, a natural consequence of the information theory that we're developing. And it's not even uh, specific. Uh, there's no, no specific biological research done on this matter uh, uh, over here. But uh, so let's just start. Uh, I'm going to say it is a bit complicated. So let me just start with a very simple abstract uh, of only two slides. Uh, so two slides is just to simplify the issue and to go from the beginning to the end. And uh, the issue here is uh, uh, from hardcore physics paradigms to biological hide and seek wars. So here we're talking about uh, physics, information theory, uh, and here we're talking about glycosylations. And at the end of this story, will still be a little bit of, of uh, uh, um, consequences for patents and things like that. Uh, OK, so here's the physics paradise. This is the first slide, uh, abstract slide. So we're going to talk about two things here in terms of the physics. Um, and uh, the physics, uh, I'm going to talk about signal to noise ratio, and I'm going to talk about channel information capacity, Shannon's uh, uh, information capacity. Uh, I marked here signal power of signal over the power of the noise. I marked it in red because that's going to be a focus point of our of, of, of this lecture. And uh, the thing to remember here is that um, that uh, the signal, the power, where is my mouse? The power of the, uh, is my mouse visible? I assume it is, yes? Okay. Uh, so here is the the uh, um, the power of the signal over the power of the noise. Since these things are powers, uh, this is always a, a, a positive uh, quantity entity. So it's it's a it's a, it's a, a positive metric. And related to that is the channel information capacity that that uh, Shannon de de defined in in 1948, where he uses that signal to noise ratio, the power, the, the positive definition of signal to noise ratio to define the information capacity of the channel. And here we see that this is a positive value. And uh, since the log of one plus some, something positive, if something positive, the information capacity will be positive. And um, that means that um, you actually need to know that there is a signal somewhere because otherwise you don't know whether you're looking at signal uh, or signal to noise. So you need to actually know the signal before you start this off, just as a, as a before you start using these metrics. So just this is just as a, as a first uh, first starter, and then we go into the second abstract slide, and that's here. This is something I downloaded from the web, and uh, we applied our our. Um, this is the the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the infectious part of the uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 vi virus, the the the, the, the this uh, <coughs> this triplet here, and uh, we see here uh, the the information metrics that we're going to come up with. They show this dark blue area here in the middle as the information dense uh, area, and the part sticking out here, uh, these little red red uh, extreme extremities here, those are actually glycosylations and some glycosylations here, glycosylations there, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, you, you can have a look at it and, and we, 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 we did predictions or just uh, do a, a you will see that we will later fill the whole the whole area around the molecule with 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 the sugars that the virus uses to to hide from the human immune system. And uh, this is the infectious part of the protein. And here we have uh, so glycosylations on all sides. And um, uh, this is the connecting part that connects it to the to the to the uh, to the membrane. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to give you and this was just to give you an impression. And then um, and then uh, we go into the lecture. So uh, <clears throat> the lecture is largely about counting and how to count correctly and the fundamental aspects of counting. And uh, 
So we are going to first start off with uh, how to count correctly. And that sounds uh, a little bit uh, uh, straightforward, but it is not always. Here you can clearly see, for example, that uh, here on the left is the inauguration of Obama uh, in 9, 2009. And you see clearly many fewer people here than on the right hand side, which was Trump's inauguration uh, just a few years ago. And uh, so <coughs> uh, the, these uh, counting statistics and fake statistics and fake counting is very important in, 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 in the story, the sloppy statistics. Now, let's now go into the type of counting that, uh, that Shannon uh, based his series on. So here we have, uh, I, I call this marble statistics, but uh, the real name is combinatorial statistics. Yes. If you know that a coin has two sides and there's only two possibilities, then the chance of the coin falling on one of those faces is, is 0 0.5, yes, one half uh, if it's a perfect coin. So, so this is um, an a priori knowledge that you have that the, the, the outcome of this experiment can be either a, a, a minus one or a plus one or whatever you, you want to call them or uh, a different one combinatorial statistics here you have a a, 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 a a bucket full of marbles and there are three different colors and then you start picking them out from there and you can start thinking about what the possibilities are the chances that you get so many green or so many blue ones or this can also be quantum states of, of, of an atom or something or, or spin states of an electrons or, or photons so um, a specific number of states uh, the three states that we have here, but you know the number of possible states beforehand. Here's the other one uh, that uh, Shannon became famous for. I mean, just uh, how do you code efficiently uh, letters of the alphabet when you're writing it uh, in, onto a hard drive, say, or when you're sending it through a channel. And so this is the type of, of accounting statistics that, that Shannon based his information theory on. And uh, he was uh, a very playful and very intelligent mathematician and uh, so uh, so he, he was uh, into coding for example this is the enigma machine in the second world war he was not this is the the, the german coding machine i think he was uh, giving advice in the second world war on how to decode the the the, the equivalent of, of this type of machine from the japanese to 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 be able to uh, to to understand what the what the military movements would be and uh, if you if you uh, <coughs> and if you take a look at the Wikipedia, he is considered the father of, of information theory. So he's uh, and and figure number one almost I think in in his 1948 paper is this one here. The S N and S plus N is something I drove. But so so this is then the idea that you have. I have a certain amount of information that I want to send through a channel. And unfortunately, the channel will add noise to this. So I have a signal that I know, and then I add noise to it. And on the other side, I will get the noise plus the signal. And uh, <clears throat> so here we are then uh, uh, with here we're then limited. We're stuck to, to the, the formula here that the information that's coming out is again this uh, according to Shannon's theory, uh, uh, one plus signal square plus noise squared. There is a problem. I mean, this is a definite positive uh, entity, yes? So, I mean, if you are here receiving the signal and if nobody sends you anything, then you all, all you get is noise and you don't know that what, what's coming out. You don't know what's on this side. So the idea of Shannon is you know the information beforehand. And uh, so in that case, it's the, the, this, this metric is about losing information. It's not about collecting information. And that's a very fundamental difference. And it took me a long, uh, long while to get to, to, to just get it. So what you actually have, you have no idea what's on the left hand side. And, uh, and uh, uh, you're only measuring this stuff here on the right hand side. And here we're, we're, we're looking at, at uh, this positive signal. Uh, but if there is no signal, then this is not a signal that's coming out. So this, uh, uh, and you have to be told that. You need to beforehand know that there is a signal being sent. Now this is uh, uh, counting statistics uh, uh, according to, to, to Shannon. And also the, um, the uh, he in his paper says that the, the, the power of the signal is independent of the power of the noise. So there's no cross terms, no cross, uh, uh, terms between the signal and the noise per definition. 
And that has a, a, a pretty fundamental consequence, as we'll see later. So this is one type of counting. This is a, a deterministic uh, um, uh, counting where you actually, what I call marble statistics. Now, there's a very different kind of statistics uh, of counting, and that's this here. Here we have Louis de Broglie, and he, uh, as a very young student, just postulated that particles had also a wave nature. And uh, the famous Young's double flit experiments is this year, where you, you let electrons fall on two slits and you, you count them, the, the arriving electrons on the other side on a detector. And by integrating this, you slowly see that this becomes a wave. It's not just a hard shadow of these two holes. No, you get a sine wave. And uh, so this is just a, a typical experiment when you have a, a young interference experiment and, and you see that here the electrons are, uh, are, um, are behaving like, like waves. Now, this is a very fundamental difference because here the counting is a different one. You don't know how many electrons or marbles you're going to count. You're go you, you, the chance of you finding a count, a quantum somewhere, is proportional to the square of the wave function. And uh, so that's a probability uh, uh, you have an exact knowledge, assume you have an exact knowledge of the wave, then uh, uh, it, it, from that you can derive the probability that you will you'll be, be counting electrons there. So, um, <clears throat> so okay, then uh, 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 <clears throat> that, that we'll be counting electrons. Uh, and this actually is something that uh, I did myself as a student in uh, at the at the uh, at the University of Groningen here, and where we did uh, where I did uh, this exactly just exactly this experiment of of, uh, of having a biprism and and doing interference experiment between two split uh, electron beams, and uh, you you get indeed this kind of the, 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 but so so this is. Um, uh, uh, this is a very different type of, of thinking than, than the, 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 uh, uh, the, the counting statistics of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Shannon. And it took me a long time. This is a very different, uh, this is this type of thinking. Yes, I showed you Louis de Broglie is here. We have Einstein here. We have Madame Curie here. I think this is Max Planck. And, and all just famous people and talking about, about uh, 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 uncertainty principles and 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 uh, the, these uh, these uh, these uh, quantum mechanical uh, bases of, of counting rather than than the the, the marble uh, base of counting. So uh, this is um, the two ways of counting. This is the basic story in terms of of, of what I'm going to say now. But I have to go a few steps back because uh, I'll give you some introduction into Fourier optics. You need to understand what resolution is. You need to understand how we're going to collect information. And so I'm going to do some basic physics here. And uh, that started young uh, in my case, in the garden in the interior of the state of Sao Paulo here, playing around with, 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 uh, with lenses. And this was uh, my first lesson in Fourier optics. Uh, and uh, you can see here this in, in a little more. Here is the sun on the left hand side. There's an object here in front of the lens, but the lens is focusing the sun and into a single point. That means that we have here a plane wave coming from the sun. The sun is so far away that we assume it's a plane wave. And then we have a lens and it focuses into a single point. And this is, uh, we have here a constant arriving on the lens and it's transformed into a single point, which is uh, mathematically speaking, a, a delta function. And then if you have, so this is a Fourier transform machine that uh, we all started playing with as, as, as children. And uh, so, uh, and if you have this Fourier transform machine and you have two of these Fourier transform machines and you have an object here in the front focal plane, there's a little scratch here, then it starts to, this becomes a secondary wave emitter. And so this point in the object becomes a plane wave in the back focal plane. The back, uh, this plane wave in the back focal plane became, becomes a point in the image. So this is a one-to-one a, a -one, uh, imaging device and it symbolizes uh, all kinds of uh, imaging machines or, uh, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, just as a cascade of two Fourier transforms. So here is a, a more professional uh, version of this drawing uh, that I've been using for teaching purposes for more than 40 years. But uh, uh, here uh, we have the plane wave, uh, plane wave leaving the object, 
being focused into a single point in the back focal plane and then becoming a plane wave here or an object, a little dot here, becoming a plane wave in the back focal plane and that plane wave becoming a dot in this front focal plane again. And from this, we have uh, famous re relations that we all know. Uh, the resolution number limit is given by the angle here, and that de depends on this aperture that you have in the back focal plane, either physical or virtual. And uh, we all know uh, Abbas uh, uh, <coughs> numerical aperture uh, uh, rules. Here we have that uh, described in, in lambda and smallest details and angles, whatever. So here is uh, Abba and Lord Rayleigh and Fritz Czernica, all the, the great, the great uh, theoreticians or from uh, from this is here from the 19th century and here from the 20th century. And he is my particular hero, hero Fritz Zernike. He had a, a very, very um, a fundamental understanding of physics. Uh, and he liked to he liked to tinker with uh, with 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 images and lenses and things like that. And there and there was he uh, he came to uh, 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 had a, a very fundamental understanding of what was happening here. And um, by understanding that he had the undifracted beam here, the, the, the plane waves that are coming here, they are focused in the back focal plane. You can just put a tiny piece of glass here and change the phase of this thing and uh, change the phase of this diffracted wave or undifracted wave with, with respect to the ones that have uh, seriously interacted with the object. and. Um, uh, and uh, by doing this, suddenly you can make a transparent object, a phase object, becoming an amplitude object that you can see in black and white. So this is um, uh, and this is a very fundamental in the, uh, understanding of, of linear systems. You have an object and then you can have the Fourier transform of the object. Let me give you an example here. So here we have a, a traditional Fourier optics uh, system uh, with transfer functions. So we have an object and um, uh, we put it through a linear imaging system and then we get uh, the, the object back uh, limited by things like, 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 a, like an aperture. And uh, <clears throat> um, so, um, and then we want to know how good this image is. So if we know this perfectly well and we know the imaging system, then, um, then we can predict what the, what, the, what the image will be. We know the object well, we know the imaging system, we can predict what the, what the output image is. And um, <clears throat> so um, uh, this is a traditional linear system. And what we can do then in, to judge its quality is compare uh, this with this or this with the second image that comes out of the same device. And that you can do by cross correlation coefficient. So here we have just the image is just a factor of many points. Uh, and we calculate the inner product between these two, two images that we have taken and then normalize it by, by the power in each of them. And so we get this cross correlated coefficient that is uh, um, <coughs> in, in the best of cases gives you the value one in, in return. There's actually no necessity to have that uh, one. If we change, uh, we have a limit imaging device that just changes everything by minus one then the output image is exactly the same as the input image, but the contrast is reversed. But the, the information is not lost because we can multiply again everything here by minus one and we get the same image. So a contrast reversal doesn't uh, cause any information loss. But the cross correlation coefficient here, the normalized cross correlation, one, so one is minus d1 and the other uh, two, d2 is minus d1, then the normalized correlation coefficient will be minus one exactly the same amount of information and uh, and uh, <coughs> um, and you have a value between minus one and plus one in this simple metric. Yes, here we have that again. Uh, we're co correlating two images, comparing two images with each other and these two images, with, comparing these two images with each other, you get the value from minus one uh, between minus one and plus one. Now, there is a problem with this normalized correlation coefficient. When you get very close to plus one or minus one, then uh, a, a, a very small change, uh, like from going from a correlation coefficient between uh, 0.99 to 0.999, uh, then that means an incredible 
difference in 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 say uh, in in the noise levels of the day. You have a lot more information if you uh, have a correlation coefficient of 0.9999 instead of only just 0.9. And this is long since understood. And uh, there's a so-called uh, uh, so Fisher transform. And if you take this normalized correlation coefficient here and do one plus or divided by mi one minus and the, the, the two log of this times a constant, but then suddenly you have, instead of running up against these limits at one and minus one and plus one, you have um, a value that uh, that can reach minus infinity and plus infinity. And this, this correctly, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, calibrates the, the, the differences between the small differences that you, you that you start to miss in cross-correlation coefficients. Okay, now, so this is an important uh, aspect. This is uh, Z, uh, the Z transformation or Fisher so Z transformation. And uh, so let's go back to, to the transfer function. Here we have object, linear imaging system, and, uh, uh, and the output of the imaging system. So what you have in linear imaging is that the Fourier transform of the object, multiply this by, by the transfer function of the imaging system. Here is a low pass filter, so you lose a little bit of the high frequency information. Go back here, you can see this one is, this Maryland monitor is a little bit blurrier than that one. So we have lost some, some, uh, some, uh, 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 no, we have lost nothing, but we, we, we can predict the output image exactly if we know the input image uh, <clears throat> and the properties of the linear system. In electromicrography, this, this then looks like that. Yeah? So here we have an object that has uh, details from, uh, say, 3 angstrom up to 30 angstrom resolution in this, in this, uh, in this uh, Siemens star. We do the Fourier transform of this. Uh, this is the amplitude uh, part. Uh, and then um, you multiply it by the transfer function of the electron microscope, which oscillates around zero, and then you get that, and you fully transform that back to 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 to, uh, to real space, and you see all these, these these contrast reversals that you have in in the electron microscope. So you can form, mathematically formulate this like the Fourier transform of the input times the transfer function is the, the Fourier transform of the output. You can also see it directly in real space, uh, the object uh, in, uh, convoluted with the point spread function of the linear system gives you the output. But um, so, so that's uh, the traditional uh, 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 linear transfer, uh, linear systems uh, in Fourier optics. You know the object, you transfer, and then you can predict what the image is. But of course, again, here we have a little problem. We have no idea what the object is. Yes, we have something in the electron microscope, or we have uh, are pointing our camera or our telescope to a certain area of the, of the sky, and you don't, no idea what the signal is, so you, you cannot predict what the outcome will come. So th this is a pretty fundamental issue that the linear system is only uh, uh, serves your purpose when uh, when you actually know what the input signal is, just like with the, the channel of, uh, of, of uh, Shannon's information channel. So um, here we go. <clears throat> and then uh, that means that we, um, uh, we have to do something else. And, uh, uh, but <clears throat> we don't know. Uh, this I mean, all that we have is images, noisy images from the object uh, that depends on the exp exposure time and all these things. And so that means also that the idea that you can use the transfers for the linear system to understand this is uh, is is limited. Here, this I've shown you before. This is the the instrumental resolution that Abba and and Rayleigh and others were were were, were talking about, and. Um, uh, but of course, uh, that doesn't mean if you have a microscope that describes a microscope. But if you forget to switch the light on in the microscope, that will you get no signal here, and so you have something very noisy there. And the fact that you have a numerical aperture in your lens doesn't mean a good numerical aperture. Doesn't mean you're going to always see this. Okay. So, uh, so, so then, then we introduce a different uh, concept, and that is uh, the results resolution. We, we, the instrumental resolution is limited by, by like the numerical aperture, but uh, we are now going to the results resolution. So let's, let's see what that means. So we're going to collect images of the object. Uh, we never know what the object is. You can never determine, uh, you, you can never know deterministically what, what the object is. So you're just collecting, collecting information and then you can sum them and you can do things and compare these things, but you have no access to this here. 
So this is the results resolution we can define based on what we are what we're collecting. And if we collect more information, we have more uh, we can have maybe a better information or better results re resolution. OK, so uh, here we go. We can use this normalized correlation coefficient to do this. But there is a problem with that is that these images images typically have a lot of low frequency components and not a lot of high frequency components. And uh, what that means then is that the correlation coefficient uh, that we have here will be fully determined by the low resolution information content of images like this. There's a lot of black here and white face. And uh, so that's going to be the, the, the correlation coefficients. So this is uh, why uh, I introduced this uh, Fourier ring correlation uh, more than 40 years ago. And uh, this Fourier ring correlation is uh, instead of having one uh, uh, normalized cross correlation coefficient from between two images, you do a ring correlation. You look at rings in Fourier space and you, uh, <clears throat> you, you have rings in Fourier space and you start to, 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 to um, to compare those images in, in Fourier space. So this is a single value. Here is a function of resolution in Fourier space. So, so uh, let me see. Uh, uh, so here, this is what we're doing. So we don't know what's coming out. We need some things and we can compare these sums of half data sets, say, and we can do that in the Fourier ring correlation. And here's the Fourier ring correlation uh, or Fourier shell correlation. The two dimensional version is here from 1982 and the three dimensional came a bit later. And uh, so here we're doing the, the correlation between two rings in Fourier space and two rings in Fourier space. And this gives you then, then the curve, which is a Fourier ring correlation curve, uh, which is uh, the standard thing that, that everybody uses today. Yes. So the, the big advantage and the same, this is actually exactly the same, uh, very comparable to that. This is between minus one and plus one. This is also between minus one and plus one. These, uh, these structure factors are, are complex values, but if you integrate them around the ring, uh, then because of the Hermitian symmetry, you, you have uh, this one and that one is a Hermitian symmetry of each other. And uh, in these cross terms, you have the same thing. So uh, they're just real normalized cross correlation coefficients that behave this way. And here you see then the, where this came from, the, these all, all model calculations that I'm showing you just to explain the, the principles, no real data. Uh, and uh, so here we have then, this is actually an old ribosome paper that we published uh, 35 years ago and com comparing the structure of two uh, 30S ribosomes from E. coli. And you see that the Fourier ring correlation here uh, behaves in a certain way. The power drops much faster because of the low frequency components. Uh, but this really uh, helped us understand how to see these, these, these structures. Here again, now this is a three-dimensional version. Here we have two structures. So what you do in, in the previous case, you have two images and compare them, yes? Like summing many of these noisy images. And uh, here again, uh, you have two structures. Uh, you just do three-dimensional reconstructions. Where they come from is not really material to this story. We have two things. They're done independent of each other so that you have the, you, you, it's not the same data. It's just the, uh, the other half of the data set, so to say. And then you, in, in three space, this is no longer a ring, but this becomes a shell in Fourier space. And you can then do these Fourier shell correlations uh, between these two. And then here is the threshold that we have defined many, many years ago uh, of how to interpret this. So here the idea is, is uh, you have a perfect correlation at low resolution. Uh, and then up the higher you go up, the higher you go in, in terms of resolution, then suddenly it's things starts, starts to, to drop rapidly. And by the time you have nothing left, uh, there's no information, no, no correlation between these two, then you see, you see this stuff uh, oscillating at, around zero at very high frequency. So this is uh, the Fourier shell correlation. And uh, the Fourier shell correlation <coughs> is become a standard now. Uh, in the morning, if you have your cup of coffee, you want to know what the newest uh, structures are, you do a Google search for Fourier shell correlation and cryo -EM, And you get uh, tons of maps and, and of all kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, values, but you, you see these curves and people have these lines in there. And these lines is what a little bit I'm going to talk about. Friend or foe, they use these two lines, uh, 0 0.5, the significant threshold of this thing at 0 0.5 or 0 0.143. They're both wrong. Um, but uh, <coughs> let me see, I, is there one that has it right here? Yeah, you have these curves here, that's the half bit threshold curve. 
uh, one of these is too small for actually to, to look at it. But oh, this one is certainly, this is something from a hemoglobin that data set that we did. And you see here these stressful curves. So um, that def determines what the resolution is. But now we're going to talk about what resolution really is. Anyway, here, when you do these things, then you have a structure here. This is by Sphirum Frubimanium. And again, a beautiful structure that they had here the, a few years ago. And and with these, uh, the fact that people put do two two threshold values in just already indicates that there's something really really wrong here. That there's no definition for what it is. Okay, so now we go into the the issue of the sloppy statistics that I already mentioned that we're going to uh, uh, that we're going to show you here, talk talk about here. And the sloppy statistics issue, um, I have got. Uh, the sloppy statistics is um, um, the sloppy statistics is an issue that uh, I, I've been hammering on for, for for decades now because people made mistakes in in in, in these statistics and uh, so this is why I talk. And when the example that I'm going to give you is from here from uh, a few years ago uh, in April 2017 when Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson and I got the Wiley Prize for um, for uh, <coughs> for doing uh, uh, the development for the pioneering development cryoelectron microscopy, and um, I will show you what I showed there in terms of, of sloppy statistics. And the sloppy statistics is the following: people always assume that you have a signal uh, and uh, a signal, and you have two measurements, and uh, the signal plus noise, and the signal plus a different realization of noise. This is the uh, uh, since whenever since uh, we, we started to, actually from before the times that we're talking the, about these uh, these Fourier shell correlations, just no, normal correlations, people were already talking about it. And then you have a very simple second, uh, a secondary school mathematics. So you have A plus B and A plus C and you have these cross products here. And if you have these cross products, then you have the, the power of the signal, signal times noise two, signal times noise one and uh, and the, 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 the cross terms between the two noise realizations. This is assuming that you have a signal plus an, an additive uh, additive noise. This is a, uh, okay, this, that's the assumption. And people then say, well, I have a signal that is uncorrelated to the, to the noise. So what can I do? I'm going to take out these, these terms. And you find that in like the first and the second sentence of the paper. And so here we go. Um, they take that out and simplify the formulas. And uh, now this is rubbish. And why is this rubbish? Well, this is because if you take them out, these terms, you're not assuming that uh, so the, uh, that in these cross terms, you're, you're not not assuming that they are. Uh, so here we have now in Fourier space, but it's exactly the same formulas. So we have uh, signal plus noise one, signal plus noise two. And you, if you if you uh, you have these cross terms here and you take them out, then uh, that just means you make them zero. And uh, that is not the same thing as telling saying that these things are, are independent. And um, so, and that's because of this here. If you have, uh, this is one signal and one noise, and you do the inner product between the two, then on average you may get say, zero, but in each individual case you don't get zero uh, when you do the inner product between these, this factor and that factor, and the image is just a factor. So here, uh, if you take the formula out, then instead of stating that, that these things are independent, you're actually st stating that they are orthogonal. And the difference between orthogonality and independent is uh, very fundamental here. I've uh, used this in New York at the time, uh, <coughs> my, in, in, in uh, uh, 2017, this is the first time that I used this, this, this joke here. And that is, now, well, you, imagine you have a couple that is wildly in love and just moved into this Manhattan apartment. And uh, in the first year that they're being together, the apartment has six rooms. Uh, there's a kitchen, a bedroom, a bathroom, a hallway, a balcony, and whatever. And here's the living room. So in the first year of their living together, they, uh, if one is watching uh, uh, the, the soap opera here, the other one is watching uh, the soap opera here on the same screen. On the same screen. So the, dis the density distribution of X over the possible rooms here and the density distribution of Y is high correlated and the inner product between these two density distributions will be one and that means uh, that uh, they're totally correlated now after seven years you have these 
they become less less uh, in, uh, more independent. So if X may be in uh, watching the TV, then X may be uh, may be watching the same screen or 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 being somewhere else and watching the sunset in the on the or doing the dishes or whatever. So there is like a random correlation between the two. They're independent. Uh, so the chances of finding both the inner product of the distribution functions will then be uh, um, square root six, where six is the number of uh, rooms that you have available. This is after seven years. And then after 14 years, if you find person Y watching a movie here on the, on his iPhone uh, uh, in, in the corner of the living room, that person X will be in the bedroom on his Android, Android phone watching something different, completely different. So whenever X, if X is one room, the other one will not. It's about time that they separate. Uh, <coughs> And uh, so, and now when you have the distribution function of these people over these these apartments, then the in distribution function, the inner product of these distribution functions will be zero. See, they're orthogonal, and that's not the same thing as independent. And uh, why uh, do I call this sloppy statistics? Um, well, here we have um, we have the the, uh, these, uh, these 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 formulas again. I don't know where this comes from. Uh, <coughs> Um, um, the, the sloppy statistics. So this is from a paper here. I put these uh, these uh, these excerpts together just so, so you can see the original work that I'm talking about. So here is a paper of uh, 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 two mathematicians, but uh, uh, Bershaw and, and and Rockmore, and they are talking about the correlation. So if if the signal to noise ratio is difficult to measure, because then maybe we can estimate it from the correlation coefficients that I've been talking about. And uh, so here they come with this function here. Uh, and uh, then this function here is taken over by, in a paper by Frank at Al Ali, exactly the same function. You see it here. And, and uh, here is the uh, paper by Saxton where he, he shows these cross terms that he's kicking out in the math. So here is it just, uh, just for you to see. So here is the. Uh, but these are mathematicians, and they say they're orthogonal, assuming orthogonality between these factors, then this is true. The thing is that, of course, these arts of granality doesn't exist in reality. And uh, and so the, you, you can there is no real data that will that will match this orthogonality principle that is described here. And uh, the argument here in, in, in Frank et al. Ali is that, well, we have so much pixels because we have big images and so on. So then we can relax the, the boundary conditions. It's just wrong. And you can see here that um, the, this is the signal to noise ratio, the cross correlation coefficient, and the cross correlation coefficient can have values around zero, yes, uh, or minus one. So if you have uh, no signal, then you have here a random oscillation around zero, and so and the small oscillation around zero here. So you have a negative value, and uh, very many negative values. Or you have like the the images uh, of Marilyn Monroe where I inverted the constant. These so so there's negative values, and the, suddenly you are assigning a negative value to the signal to noise ratio. That's beyond its, its definition uh, de definition range. So what have I uh, uh, used here that was uh, uh, during a lecture at the Nobel Prize uh, Symposium about cryo-EM that same year, later that year. I see, so what did we do wrong? Well, there's the mathematician that first, uh, the mathematician who first assumes a, a spherical cow in vacuum. And then comes the microscopist. Uh, let's apply this to real electromicroscopical particles on the grid. So uh, the, there's a real problem here in, in, in uh, uh, the boundary conditions and the, and the realistic, uh, it's just not realistic. And I mean, I've, I've been publishing about this for, for decades that I was wrong and people don't want to listen and they don't cite it. And yes. So here's again, uh, uh, just, uh, and now it's become here Frank at Al Ali only just referring to himself here or to, to the self. And, and, and exactly the same, the same function long beyond, but this is, as I said, uh, really wrong. And uh, uh, this is uh, this can oscillate a lot around zero. This can be negative, and the signal to noise ratio is not negative. So we have a real problem here. And so here it then brings us back to the story of of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the signal to noise ratio <clears throat> that is positive, and this is positive, and we have a real problem with that. Here's the same story, but then without the biology in the background, <coughs> and. Um, and uh, so 
And then, then uh, so this is one story to keep in mind. And the other story is that of the of the normalized cross correlation, uh, and that we can use the Fisher transform to to really spread that out over all reasonable values. And in terms of Fourier space, we can do the same. So here we have these were also between minus one and plus one. What are we going to do now? We're going to do the Fisher transform here, and then suddenly we have uh, what I call what we call the uh, Fourier shell information, and this goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and that solves uh, many problems, as as I will say, I'll, I will show you in a few examples later. Uh, first, we uh, have here then uh, a little story on Intermezzo here of uh, I arrived here in Brazil uh, in in uh, in 2017, and uh, uh, where uh, where uh, Rodrigo and I have been very busy setting up a facility and teaching schools here that we have started in 2005 to educate the new generation of of uh, microscopists, and in that same year. Uh, we already had uh, here what uh, Rodrigo had already organized the whole uh, the building a new building and we ordered microscope all these things and here he's pulling in the new microscope this is in August uh, 2018 uh, pulling in the new microscope into the new building and uh, with the help of some friends here and we now are uh, the proud uh, owner of the uh, first cryos in the in in in, in Latin America. And uh, so this uh, was in, uh, delivered in 2018, and, and after much much uh, problems, and, and, and uh, it, it was it was operational became operational in December of, of last year, just uh, uh, before Christmas or just before the Christmas break. And the computer clusters has been so. This is now a real operating facility. And uh, so what we have done here in in these few years, just on the side, and so the, these theoretical things go a little bit on. Uh, is a different. So all, all the teaching that we've done many years, the building. I don't. I have no idea exactly. I mean, that's the years of planning to do that. There were some already ex, uh, entry level microscopes in to, for cry for for cry OEM to do low resolution work and preparing samples. The the so here the cryo was in. Uh, in 2008 19 and training the people and when we started to use actually it turned out to be totally unstable and so we spent uh, I at least uh, together with Rodrigo spent uh, uh, four months just trying to debug this uh, this this beast and uh, understand what was wrong uh, and where the problems were so the first data sets were collected in December 2019 and uh, we had no computer power uh, essentially available, so this was done on home home computers, the first test. But here then now since uh, since March, just at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a cluster available. And then in spite of the pandemic, we now are coming up with with uh, various uh, uh, structures uh, at, at, in work class apart from the methodology. So just on the side, because uh, uh, we have apart from theoretical work, <laughs> some real. So this, these things here have now uh, been implemented here. And they were, this is the, the ABC alignment by classification algorithm that, that, that is one of our favorite. And so this is this is done, and then we do a three-dimensional structure between two 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 spheres here, or two viruses, or two ribosomes. Then you do this here uh, to hemoglobins. So you do a Fourier shell correlation. I've shown you that, showed you that before, and you look at this Fourier shell correlation. Now. Um, <coughs> So, um, uh, but as I said, the Fourier shell correlation, we can now actually extend into Fourier shell information. And the consequences of that are pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, uh, so we're no longer talking about just the Fourier shell curve. We have a, a, another function here, the, the, the Fourier shell information that turned out to be a very, very powerful thing. And so the Fourier shell information has still some problems. This is just a direct log of uh, of, of the using the Fourier shell uh, correlation. And uh, so we have the R weighted. It's actually an R square weighted in this case, in the three dimensional case, and we can do that. So this is then the classical Fourier shell correlation that we have between two and and between two half data sets where we have a total of so many particles, or half that, or half that, or half that, and you can see how these things these things uh, change with the number of particles. And here we can see the uh, the uh, the different threshold levels with the Fourier shell correlation threshold value that we defined uh, some 20 years ago, uh, which is the half bit threshold value. 
So that's nice. You can see here these different le levels of, of, of resolution. And, um, and here, just to put some lines in to give you a feeling of, of, just, of comparison here, you see here that the Fourier shell correlation is all very close to, to, to one. And I told you that it doesn't, a small difference here can be quite a difference in, 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 in information. And here are the different levels that we found with, the, with our conventional half, half bit threshold. And uh, out here, actually in the top left corner, uh, you think that you have fantastic information because that thing is one. Well, it's not tr exactly true. This is actually completely oscillating because this is very close to the origin. You have very few measurements, and very few sample points. So the, the, the error level at that level is very, very high and the information is just not there. And so this is a, this is a wrong metric, at least uh, uh, this was the, but it does have the, uh, the same threshold that we had previously, the half bit threshold as a straight line here because it's a direct log of, of, the, of, the, of the Fourier cell correlation. But if you weigh this correctly with the with the, the radius, because why the radius? For, why why have this radius? Well, because in Fourier, where is the function here? Yeah, this why that? Because well, uh, if you are further out in Fourier space on a sphere, then you have many more sample points. So you you can actually fit much more information in higher resolution than you can fit uh, close to the origin, because there's just less less to be to be uh, to be uh, to be measured. And here you suddenly see you have a metric that allows you to, we're doing exactly the same experiment here. We can see how, how in certain areas, depending when you're noise limited, doubling your data set, you're doubling the amount of information. And if you are in, at this level here, then uh, when you have a lot of information, then uh, it becomes a linear increase in, 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 in information. So this is a, this is a very, um, <coughs> very, uh, important new perspective on these things, and um, this perspective. <coughs> I don't believe it. We're on time. <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> and the, the the perspective on these things changed uh, depending then uh, uh, with th with this much better metric. And uh, so uh, here we're talking about um, about. Uh, uh, <clears throat> about the the, uh, the conventional Fourier shell correlation uh, between two volumes that you reconstructed, uh, and uh, now you take the Fourier shell correlation. So this was what uh, Harouz and uh, George Harouz and I had uh, defined many years ago, and now uh, uh, in our latest paper that has been just uh, 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 appeared just in archives. <coughs> um, uh, with, with this metric here, we, with this uh, replaces that that uh, that Fourier shell correlation, and we have a much much better um, a much better control. Uh, th this is just sections to a 3D structure, a vitreous three D structure, uh, and have put a symbolic uh, volume around it because the whole all these different sections fit within this. But how you compare this? But there is no reason uh, for you to just look at the whole thing at once. You want to maybe look at things. Uh, more locally, and this is actually so you do exactly the same thing, but then uh, uh, focused on a small area. And uh, instead of having uh, uh, of looking at this function, we have this we calculate this function over each of these volumes that we're comparing between there and there. But when then we integrate the information that you have here, so you have a metric of integrated information over all re relative all relevant spatial frequencies. And so we have integrated local information density. We call that local information density. And with that, suddenly you can see things that uh, people had never seen before. Uh, this is, uh, 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 I have a movie of that. I don't know. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. That important. So here we have, this is a, these are stereo pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm very used to look at look at stereo pictures. This is the scent. This is the hemoglobin of uh, Lumicus terrestris, the, the common earthworm. And you see here, uh, for those of you, uh, it's very, of course, impossible to, to do stereo right now. But just to give you an impression, here is a, a glycosylation that's sticking out of the central part of uh, of this this uh, this uh, this uh, um, uh, this hemoglobin, this huge hemoglobin. And here we're looking at the same uh, same glycosylation spreading out of a larger area. Uh, this was work that we have pioneering work that we did with uh, Julia, uh, uh, Juliana a while ago, and um, uh, and uh, uh, which is now part of of, of, of this this information paper that we did. And then not only so here at, at different threshold levels we can ex uh, show more of the glycosylation, 
And uh, the same we did here, uh, just downloading stuff from the database. Uh, we don't have access to the real data. They don't have the two different half volumes to compare. So we compare two different volumes with each other. We still manage to show uh, the glycosylation pattern around this, uh, around the the uh, uh, the SARS cohort, the spike protein, which is the infectious part of the thing. So um, and um, um, okay, yes, uh, five minutes. <laughs> That's what I have. <laughs> I'm on time, <laughs> told you 50, 50 minutes, 55. So um, uh, <clears throat> this was an, uh, me talking to Edson just, just uh, in the background, uh, visually. But here is uh, then now you see the, the same, um, the same uh, 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 spike protein that I showed you earlier, but then now uh, are the, uh, the thresholds at the different glycosylation level, at the different threshold level. And so we're, we're seeing things in these structures. This is a, a structure published by David uh, <coughs> Wiesler, who once was a, a student of our Brazil school. Uh, and he, uh, um, and, uh, and so uh, we, we're just comparing that with, with, a, with, with, a, with a different structure in the data, database to start to understand it. We actually need to uh, have data sets uh, uh, from original data. Uh, but so just just get you, I mean, you, we didn't do any experiment here, just testing the methodology. Okay, so this has just been published. Um, I don't know why. I, so this has just been published, as I said here, uh, using this, uh, this uh, thing as an example. And uh, let's go back to Shannon. So we said here, Shannon, we have no idea what's happening there. And uh, 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 by the way, I found one statement in the past here about from, from in a tweet uh, and where people say, Shannon information can only be lost, never gained. I really, I had, didn't understand, I didn't find this person. So it's, uh, he took the same picture here and, and use that. And then now comes the, 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 the a, a different aspect to it, and that is a, a very important aspect. And maybe uh, it's good that I'm running short because otherwise I will, I will say too much. And that's about transducers. Because uh, where uh, th this idea here has, uh, has, uh, uh, has, has a, how do you call it, a very uh, a fundamental uh, uh, consequences in terms of, of patents and things like that. Because what have I done? I've told you that Shannon's information is not an information. It's only something, it's not something with, with which to harvest information. It's only not losing information. It's a completely different concept. And if you have a transducer, you're collecting new information. So uh, just do a quick uh, Google search, patent signal to noise ratio about 2,800,000 uh, results in 0 0.52 seconds. This tells you the importance of the concept of signal to noise ratio. And I'm just telling you, people are uh, in, in, interpreting the signal to noise ratio as information. It is not. Here, look at the number of, whatever the issue is, electrocardiograms or decoding or, or uh, <coughs> It doesn't really matter. And this is a, a particularly important one here. Like if you are going, you have uh, been diagnosed with, with, with uh, COVID-19 and they're going to take your pictures of your lungs, uh, then uh, the x-ray machine that you are being subjected to, that x-ray machine is approved by the uh, uh, FDA, Food and Drug, uh, based on the detective quantum efficiency. The detecting quantum efficiency is generally defined as the ratio of the squared output signal to noise ratio to the squared input signal to noise ratio. I have just told you that the signal to noise ratio is not an information metric. It's an inform it's, it's a metric that tells you if you already know everything, uh, but it's not a metric for information. So here uh, we have redefined these things. This, this goes to zero at zero frequencies and it's completely unstable. So uh, it just, and, and this is what you find in the literature, everybody talking about this is horrible. This is, you have to do all kinds of tricks and this, that, and the other. And so this, the, the all transducers that we use in electron microscopy or in electron or in, for a synchrotron or for x-ray, for x-ray pictures uh, in, of patients or, or, or tomography uh, of patients, uh, all these things uh, are based, I mean, they are based on having a high DQE. Uh, otherwise, you cannot sell that, 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 that equipment. This thing uh, it keeps appearing there, I don't know why. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, um, it's a bit disturbing, I don't know. If I click here, it's probably not. 
Mm, I don't know. Yeah, it goes away. So um, <coughs> uh, here we have uh, the signal to noise ratio. Let me go back again because I'm where. I'm. So so it, here we have then instead of this DQE, we have now proposed that there's also a patent applied for these things, uh, the, the transducer information efficiency. And so instead of having this uh, signal to noise ratio, we're doing the Fourier shell information between the input and the output image. So here we have a, a device, forget what's on the left hand side, let me go to the next one. Here, so you, 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 you have collected data sets like here from, uh, from through a machine, uh, and uh, here's the machine, you have the data, come, but in fact you don't know what's coming out. So here's the, the Fourier ring information in and the Fourier, uh, Fourier shell information or ring information in and Fourier ring information out, but you don't actually need to have access to that because if you change something, uh, because this is a problem, you, you don't know what's in there again, but you can repeat this kind of thing with different transducers and you can have compare one camera with another camera and it makes perfect sense that the information goes up by three bits if you have an exposure time that is uh, that is uh, eight times longer. And electron microscopy is the same thing. Uh, you can do measurements like this and, and compare them before and after. So this is a data set from FEI or now Thermo Fisher. Uh, on different cameras, we have here Falcon 2 and here an Eagle uh, camera. This is data set that we have collected a long time ago already by, uh, by from FEI in, in Eindhoven. And, uh, and so you can compare them. Suddenly you have something, a real metric uh, to do these things with. And the interesting thing is just showing you in one example of how, here is the, 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 the a picture on, 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 on the DQE that was done by the group of, of uh, Richard Henderson in, in, at MRC. And this is the, uh, the same thing done on the same type of camera by, by FEI themselves. And they say, oh, well, uh, what we measure here is different from what they, our camera is actually worse than is suggested by our customers. And well, and you see exactly that this, this thing just doesn't work at zero. So the problem is not that the, the camera is better or not, it's the problem, the metric is not good. And so all the x-ray equipment that we uh, get subjected to is uh, are, are, are uh, based on this kind of definition. So I have to thank many people. Uh, Michael Schatz is the co-author of this paper that we're just sub submitting, and then many other people contributed uh, along the way. And uh, Rodrigo here, especially in in uh, in, in uh, uh, when he was a, a, a postdoc in my group in 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 London, and now of course Juliana da Fonseca more than ever. Uh, Juliana da Fonseca was did the first uh, uh, hemoglobin experiment. Cyan in Calcutta is doing comparisons of of different systems. We're using these ideas. Helder here from from biology did some uh, did a lot of stuff. We use some of these graphics just for the graphics. Um, here is uh, George Arouse. Uh, he was the, the first co-author on the Fourier shell correlation. I haven't spoken to him in two years, but uh, so he still is uh, one of the main and many. Uh, this is a, this is a product that went on over 20 years. So I thank you for the, your attention and uh, give the word back to the chairman.